Spread the fire. Welcome to another guest analysis episode on SMWX. My name is Silo Ivan Pate. Today I'll be talking about a common law rule called the subjudice rule or the subjudicare rule. This is a rule that I believe uh, is loosely used and is usually wielded by those in power. Then the question becomes, is the subjudice rule a tool for justice or is it a shield for the powerful? I'll be breaking down my analysis into three parts. The first part will be what the subjudice rule is and its brief history. The second part is the subjudice rule within the South African context. And finally, part three, the misuse of the subjudice rule, as well as what can be done to curb its blatant misrepresentation. Part one. So what is the subjudice rule? In short, this rule means that when a matter is presently being heard by a court of law, it cannot be discussed publicly in a manner that could prejudice the final decision. Breaching the subjudice rule can lead to one being criminally charged for contempt of court. And a sanction that is attached to that is either a fine or imprisonment. We saw recently um, when the former president, Jacob Zuma, was imprisoned for 15 months. It was because of a contempt charge. So this is the potential fate that may fall on a person who breaches the subjudice rule. So what is, what is its primary objective? It is to preserve and protect the integrity of active cases, as well as spare them from any interference. But what I find disheartening, it's the manner in which public servants exploit this rule in order to avoid answering difficult questions and thus not being held to account in the public's eye. We see this when a politician is facing charges, particularly when there's damning charges against them, and then a journalist poses questions with respect to the merit of the case, the response is usually, a hey, chief, the matter is subjudice, I can't talk about it. But when they are of the opinion that their opponent's case is weak or that um, it is politically motivated, they are more than willing to make public pronouncements about the merits of the case. This blatant selectivity of the application of the rule has far-reaching consequences, which cannot be ignored. It was important for me to lay down this foundation and explain what the rule is and its objective so that I can separate it from the colloquial understanding, particularly in South Africa, which is if a matter or when a matter is before a court of law, it therefore cannot be discussed. That is wrong. And I will argue later that it is even unconstitutional. So let's get into the brief, the brief history of the subjudice rule. So subjudice is a branch of contempt by publication. And contempt by publication, which is a facet of criminal contempt of court, can be traced back to 1742, when Lord Chief Justice Hardwick identified three types of contempt of court. The first was, of course, subjudice, second, scandalizing, and third is contempt directed at abusing parties that are before court. In his explanation of the term subjudice, Lord Hardwick explained it as um, actions that prejudice mankind by manipulating public opinion against parties that are um, before a court before final verdict has been granted. So now, when you look or zone into the, the words that are used by, by, by Lord Chief Justice Hardwick, which is prejudice mankind, it implies that the harm he sought to curtail 
is the impact of the statements or publication on those that are outside of the court as opposed to those that are inside, in particular the, um, the presiding officers, the jury, as well as the litigants themselves. The subjudice rule was further broadened in the late 1800s to cover publications that intend on prejudicing ongoing trials. It was in the 1970s where the rule reached its pinnacle, where we, we saw the House of Lords, which is UK's parliament, establish what it called the prejudgment test or principle that regarded publications um, or statements concerning ongoing cases to be unacceptable if those publications or statements posed a real risk of prejudicing the administration of justice. Now, this is the form in which the subjudice rule has taken and is accepted globally. And you can see that it has stared away from what was intended by Lord uh, Chief Hardwick, Lord Chief, Lord Chief Justice Hardwick, to now being a rule that seeks to focus on penalizing actions that um, obstruct justice and also uh, uh, serves as a means to persecute authors of publications that are intended at influencing the minds of, judi of the judiciary as well as the jury. Now that I have provided um, this context of what the rule is and its brief history, let's get into the subjudice rule in the South African context. Part two, the subjudice rule within the South African context. So if you can take a look at the colloquial interpretation of the subjudice rule in South Africa particularly, it is my argument that it is unconstitutional and is even incorrect. It is understood to mean that when a matter is before a court, the merits of that case cannot be discussed. That's not what it means. But even if we have to take it like that, it is unconstitutional because the kind of constitution that we adopted in 96 provided us with fundamental rights and gave them equal status. So this colloquial understanding of the subjudice rule, um, its application seems to um, or tends to disproportionately favor fair trial rights at the expense of freedom of expression, its related rights, as well as undermine the principle of participatory de democracy, accountability, transparency, as well as openness, of which the, the, the right to freedom of expression is at the center of promoting those principles. Freedom of expression can be located under Section 16 of the Constitution, which provides, among others, the rights of the public to receive information as well as free and independent media. The former Chief Justice Mukhoeng Mukhoeng, I believe it was in the EFF case, described this right as the, love, as the lifeblood of a genuine constitutional democracy whose characterization underscores the importance of maintaining a vibrant democracy. This highlights the important and the influential role that this right plays in society, and it, we must make sure that it is not limited unjustifiably. In fact, Section 7 of the Constitution mandates the states to protect, respect, promote, as well as fulfill all um, the, the rights that are in Chapter 2, which is the Bill of Rights. Now, the constitutional framework that we have adopted um, does not create or have a pyramid structure of rights where it elevates, in particular for this uh, purpose, the rights uh, of fair trial rights above the right to freedom of expression. Instead, 
it requires them to be reconciled. But where we do find constitutional rights are mutually, uh, the constitutional rights themselves are mutually limiting in that they're in conflict. So the full enjoyment of one right um, necessitates the limitation of the full enjoyment of the one right. It is the court's responsibility to intervene and reconcile them. And this reconciliation is done within the constraints of Section 36, which is the limitations clause. Okay. It is important, therefore, to understand that you cannot just be invoking the sub rule, okay, because then two rights are in, in, in conflict. And the only way Section 36 allows us to limit a right, which seems to be the case if you look at the strict application of the colloquial understanding of the sub rule, is that you must limit a rule or a right, in a fundamental right, to the extent that is necessary in order to accommodate the other one. So you cannot put a blanket plan. A case in point of this is the landmark case that was handed down by the Supreme Court of Appeal, Medi Television versus Director of Public Persecution. Although the court there was dealing with contempt of court, it is necessary you know, for the purpose of my analysis. Before the court were two fundamental rights that were in contrast. The right to freedom of expression as well as the right to fair trial. And this is usually the case when the sub rule is usually invoked. It is important to highlight, though, that the, the Supreme Court of Appeal was not dealing with the sub I know I'll be splitting hairs, you know, because it was dealing with contempt, and contempt is a facet or a subdivision of sub rule, but the court did not make any pronouncement about this rule nor its current application. But what is important from the SCA is that it established a new test for contempt of court. It called it the real risk test. And this is a test that must be fulfilled or satisfied by any individual who seeks to prohibit a particular publication um, from engaging on the merits of a case that is before a court. So it's got three cumulative requirements that must be satisfied. The first is such an individual must, who wants to uh, prohibit a publication, must show um, a relationship between the publication and the prejudice that it will cause on the administration of justice. Secondly, if such a prejudice exists, it must be of a considerable degree. And finally, there must be a real risk, a genuine, tangible danger of the alleged prejudice actually occurring. So this prejudice that will be you know, raised um, is supposed to be supported by concrete evidence. Because as the SCA said, mere conjecture or speculation is insufficient. It is tried, therefore, that the real risk test places a substantial burden on any person who seeks to limit a publication and thus um, restrict the, uh, 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 the right to freedom of expression. It is my argument, therefore, that a similar standard should be attributed to uh, or used as a standard of the sub rule because it will become exceptionally challenging for politicians to exploit it and to avoid accountability. Why? They would have to undertake the difficult process of demonstrating that a real risk of prejudice um, um, is, will, will occur if they were to respond to the parliamentary inquiry or media inquiry pertaining to the merits of an ongoing case that they are involved in. This part of the analysis, it should be understood against the backdrop of what was said by the Constitutional Court in the United Democratic Movement case. The Constitutional Court held that openness, responsiveness, as well as accountability enjoins the president of the republic together with his entire cabinet to report regularly and fully to parliament on the executions of their obligations. 
So contrary to the colloquial understanding of the subjudice rule in South Africa, which prohibits, publica- which prohibits discussions or reflections on matters simply because they are before a court, which I say it's unconstitutional and, and it's incorrect, I have to um, emphasize that the subjudice rule does not impose a general ban on discussing the merits of a case simply because they are before um, a, a, um, a court of law. It only does that if discussing it is done in a manner that could influence the judgment or prejudice the administration of justice. Now let's get into the first example, which is Rule 89 of the Rules of the National Assembly. It is titled Matters of Subjudice. It expressly states that no member may reflect upon the merits of a matter on which a judicial decision in a court of law is pending. I mean, this puts a blanket ban on discussion and debate in parliament merely on a case merely on a matter because it is currently before a court again it's incorrect and it's unconstitutional why firstly it contravenes the very spirit of the subjudice rule itself which i have mentioned earlier secondly it hinders parliament from having open and robust debate in you know, its committees and in the, you know, the National Assembly itself. And finally, which is most important, it contravenes the Constitution or violates it. Right to freedom of expression, um, access to information, as well as undermines transparency and um, accountability. This notion that I'm putting forth is, was shared as well by the Constitutional court in DA versus Public Protector, where it heard um, arguments from the former Public Protector advocate Busue Mukweban, who sought to rely on this very Rule 89 um, to stop the Section 194 inquiry from doing its job, because it would mean that they would have to discuss the merits of her rescission application as well as her application to interdict the entire process and set aside her um, suspension uh, 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 matter. The Constitutional Court rejected that argument and in fact said that if the subjudiced rule was to be applicable, then that would restrict Parliament from doing its job and fulfilling its obligation, which is to hold her accountable. So if the subjudice rule was to be applicable in that manner, um, the Constitutional Court continued, then anyone who finds themselves in a similar position as um, the former public protector and they want to avoid us answering or being held accountable, all they would then need to do is lodge litigation against the process and then that's the end of the matter. That's the absurdity that the colloquial or uh, understanding of the subjudice rule has created and has found itself, you know, into the rules of parliament. It is unfortunate that the, the constitutional court did not rule on the constitutionality of Rule 89, nor its application. So as things stand, the rule is what it is. But we cannot take away from the fact that it prevents parliament from doing its job. Furthermore, the the right to freedom of expression is granted to everyone within the borders of South Africa. But our constitution takes it a step further, right? It, when it comes to um, uh, members of the executive as well as those members of the legislature. According to section 58, it grants them not only freedom of expression, but it exempts them from civil and criminal liability for anything that they say in parliament or its, in its committees. So, I mean, if you have that constitutional pro- protection and extra veil of protection, then why do we then have the uh, Rule 89? You know, again, while one can say, okay, but that's the protection that the executive or politicians will only um, have protection under in parliament. 
But again, outside of parliament, okay, you, 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 you can't still use the subsidized rule in order to escape answering the questions or discussing merits of the case when you are asked, say, by a journalist. Why? Because they have their right to uh, freedom of expression, and you can only limit that to the extent that is necessary to accommodate another right being fair trial rights. So let's go to example number two, which is the signal jamming in the National Assembly. Wow. You know, this incident stands as a moment where we went back as a democracy, and at the center of it is Mr. Ramaphosa, who at the time he was the deputy president of South Africa, as well as the leader of government. In 2015, during SONA that was delivered by Mr. Zuma at the time, who was the president, a scuffle broke out between the EFF and the security officials. And what happened thereafter may only be described as a utter suppression and violation of the right to freedom of expression. As soon as the scuffle broke out, the visuals of parliament focused into this face of the Speaker of Parliament at the time, which was Ms. Balak Ambeta, deliberately not showing the, 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 the scuffle that was taking place and preventing the public from seeing the, or witnessing the events real, in real time. But furthermore, a signal jamming device was then um, activated by the state security agency without the authorization nor the knowledge of the speaker. In fact, in her um, submission to the Supreme Court of Appeal that presided over the signal jamming case, she said she was not even aware that the signal jamming device was in, um, in, in, in the building of parliament. Those revelations are quite concerning. Why? Because Section 401 of the Powers and Privileges and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislature explicitly guides or grants the Speaker of Parliament um, the exclusive authority to decide on security measures. You know, now it is the signal jamming this jammer was an unlawful action that restricted media and everyone inside parliament from communicating um, 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 the events to the public. Now, this is where I'm going with this. Afterwards, Mr. Ramaphosa was before parliament to answer all questions, and two questions were put to him by Musi Mamani. The first was, when did he become aware of the intention to use the signal jamming device? And secondly, can he guarantee the nation that parliament will not use such drastic measures, security measures? In his response, he said he can't answer because the matter will soon be heard by parliament. I mean, put differently, Ramaphosa just wielded the subjudice rule and, and sidestepped my, uh, my money's uh, question. You know, however, at the time he responded, the matter was not even heard for arguments. So even if Ramaphosa sought to rely um, on Rule 89, the absurd Rule 89, he was not going to be successful because the, the, this signal jamming case had not set down for arguments. So the Speaker of the National Assembly was uh, under the duty to compel, to compel Ramaphosa to respond to those questions that were posed by Musi Maimani. It's been seven years approximately since the SEA provided its judgment that said that the signal jam, the use of the signal jamming device was unlawful and violated the constitution. And he to whom the question was posed is still shrouded in silence. So finally, what can be done to curb um, the blatant exploitation? Because it's quite clear that the current use of the subjudice rule restricts the right to freedom of expression and favors the protection of fair trial rights. And it also encroaches on the principles of transparency, openness, as well as accountability. So what should we do? Should we get rid of it? 
Look, I'm not here to advocate that we get rid of the rule. In fact, Section 39 of the Constitution says if a rule is not consistent with the constitutional, with the Constitution, then it must be developed. I'm saying that we should follow the UK route. Anyway, this is an English law rule after all, um, where they codified the subjudice rule into a legislation called um, Contempt of Court Act. And this act addresses actions that obstruct the administrations of justice, undermine the authority of the court, as well as interfere with the effectiveness of the judicial process. And the threshold on limiting the publication or statements concerning pending cases or active cases is similar to that that I mentioned earlier of the Medi case uh, that was um, handed down by the Supreme Court of Appeal. So it, this, this act strikes a balance between that rule and the two conflicting rights, fair trial rights and the right to um, um, freedom of expression. I submit that this is the only way in which we can decisively deal with the deficiencies that I've highlighted earlier on about the subjudice rule, because then we'll be able to give it content and scope so that we know when to use it. And when those that are aggrieved, usually the media or the members of parliament, they are able to use this act to seek recourse and get to a point whereby they will be able to compel a particular politician to discuss the merit of a case that they're involved in. So please comment below. Tell us what are your thoughts about this presentation and whether you think that the subjudice rule is a tool for justice or a shield for the powerful. Aye.